and welcome to a special Think Tech Hawaii panel presentation on addressing Hawaii's cost of living and homelessness, finding meaning after the pandemic. I'm Mark Schlaub, the host of this special program. Today, our panel will discuss the cost of living, housing, and homelessness in Hawaii, how homelessness affects the Hawaii economy, what our future looks like, and what can be done to improve the situation after the pandemic. Our four panelists are Nolan Ahn, Christine Camp, Connie Mitchell, and Sarah Lynn. They are extremely knowledgeable in the social, economic, and governmental perspectives of these issues. Our program goals are for us to have a good discussion, to share ideas, to listen to each other, to participate with Aloha, and ultimately to help Hawaii find meaning in the future. Our first panelist is Nolan Ahn. Nolan is a graduate of the University of Hawaii and was the founder and principal planner of Anui Nui Associates. He is now retired, but still very active in the community. Nolan is a prolific and passionate op-ed writer and his articles in the Garden Island newspaper about finding meaning for Hawaii after the pandemic are the genesis for this program. Thanks to my big brother, John Schlav, for introducing me to Nolan. I've asked Nolan to set the stage for this program. Nolan? Thanks for having me on the second time for uh, 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 on ThinkTech. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Um, yeah, so like you said, we started out being uh, talk too much, op-ed writer, uh, venturing my opinions out there and some other paper printed them. And I've had good and bad uh, uh, reactions to them. Uh, just like we'll have today, as promised by our other panelists, we'll have <laughs> agreement and disagreement. Uh, so the finding meaning for Hawaii kind of started out, you know, when I was feeling really funky uh, in the early months of the pandemic. And, you know, and saying, what's going on? I don't usually feel like this. And uh, so um, I started reading more as a lot of us uh, uh, during this downtime. And uh, I read this book uh, called Finding Meaning, The Sixth State of Grief by David Kessler, who collaborated with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on, you know, the five stages of grief. That's a classic. And I kind of found that many of the feelings about having somebody die that you're close to uh, uh, was what I was feeling. And, you know, it was... Um, the denial, the anger, the bargaining, depression, and uh, not yet the, 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 the feeling of acceptance of what was going on. But Kessler uh, ventured forth that says there may be a sixth stage to grief that will allow you to heal after the loss. And that sixth stage was finding meaning in the life of the person that you have lost. Um, so... Uh, we went on from that and, you know, we ventured forth um, uh, opinions that says, how can we find meaning after the pandemic? Uh, and, um, you know, we said, maybe we can tackle the three biggest problems that Hawaii faces. And in my opinion, again, uh, um, those were uh, homelessness, affordable housing, and over tourism. Uh, and I ventured forth the idea that says, what if the solution to one would be able to fund the needs of the other two? And you know, I ventured a crazy idea that says, in this time that we're 98% less tourists than we used to have, 10.4 million in 2019, and uh, trickles now, that maybe we ought to think that instead of opening up the floodgates 100%, that we ought to think about putting up barriers to tourists, economic barriers that would be able to provide funding to solve our greatest problems. Uh, 
in, in my crazy thoughts, this would raise $10 billion of new state revenues. And so the state budget this year is $8 billion, and they're expected to fall at least $2 billion short. Um, so, uh, Melissa, can we have slide uh, uh, number one, please? Okay, so we're coming up with the finding meaning for Hawaii, and my thoughts are going to be centered around, can we eliminate the problem of homelessness out of the One of my favorite quotes is by Soren Kirkgaard, and he says, life is lived forwards but understood backwards. And then once I revisited this quote of mine, then I started thinking about my thoughts about grief. And now I think, that, um, you know, I'm not really experiencing grief about the loss of a life that I used to love before COVID. I am, because my life has not died. Instead, COVID has put it into a state of a medically induced coma. And so my life is not dead, but it's also not alive. And I miss it terribly, but <laughs> I cannot grieve because it's not dead. My thoughts are, you know, it's like um, uh, if I can't grieve, then the only thing left for me is hope. Focus on hope. The only thing that you're doing on is focusing on the future. And the future is certainly uncertain. So I had outlined the three greatest problems. I had talked in, in extent about over tourism and then, you know, trying to put up uh, uh, economic fences. I'm sure Christine is going to do a lot on an affordable housing issue, but um, I'm going to uh, skip over a lot of this talk about the three greatest problems. But just to touch on it, in 1959, we had 250,000 visitors to Hawaii. Uh, and it was the number four largest industry at the time. By 1976, tourism had become the number one industry in Hawaii. And last year, it brought in 10.4 uh, uh, million tourists into our state. Uh, the question is, uh, did the state of Hawaii really want 10.4 million visitors? And I say, Absolutely. They did everything they could to be able to achieve that number. And I asked the second question is, do they want the 98% less that we have now? Yes, because all of the things that they did, they put up all the barriers to avoid 100% uh, infection rate to uh, uh, thousands of deaths. And so we have less visitors. If you wanted visitors, we wouldn't have had any of the restrictions uh, that we have now. This is a picture of my brother Rodney, and uh, it just points out that homelessness affects us all. I'll tell you that, you know, what happened is that when he was in his early 50s, he had a bad marriage, he had a bad divorce, and a series of events that caused him to retreat into the valleys of Kalalau. And he lived there uh, uh, independently, not getting any public welfare, uh, uh, until we, as a family, distributed uh, uh, his share of uh, the value of my parents' house who had passed on. At the time that he got it, he said, wow, I've got enough money to last the rest of my life. And, you know, it was about $50,000. Mine was gone in an instant because I was sending three kids to college. And then he said, wow, I've got enough for the rest of my life which I thought was interesting. When he died at age 58 in the Valley, he had about $200 left. So I think that he made his life adjust to his money. And he said, I made a prediction and I made it come true. So I'm gonna ask the question, if Hawaii has the will to eliminate uh, homelessness, the reality is that we continue to have a significant population and we're expected to have more. Question is, whose job is it? Some people say churches, some people say families, <laughs> a nonprofits, and the state. In my opinion, the state has the primary responsibility. It's got the 
power of taxation and it's got the power to interpret laws on uh, 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 and the laws that regard losses of individual freedoms in respect to the public good. And uh, my opinion is they have the responsibility which they have not necessarily been exerting all of the responsibility. Next slide, please. In my opinion, homelessness should not be an option. <laughs> Anybody that has been on the streets or in an, uh, a, a camping situation where it's miserable, minutes seem like hours uh, and uh, it, it's street is just not a good place. In my opinion, again, that the homelessness can be separated in two categories. One is the unable, and the second is the unwilling. Uh, if the state exerts its responsibility to be able to help those, the least fortunate among us, they have the power to do so, but along with that power comes with great responsibility. With $10 billion of new revenue, and the question says, what if we had enough money? Money always seems to be a barrier. Uh, $10 billion can buy 10,000 $1 million homes or three quarters of one rail system. <laughs> so uh, with enough money, what would we do with it? I think that the state has the responsibility and the ability to raise the money. But at this point, I don't think that they should be the provider of those services that perhaps they ought to be providing money to those that are able to do, do a better job than uh, their history has shown. Am I nearing my time there? Yes, you are. You're almost pal. Okay, well, next slide. Let me go to the last one then. Uh, is our state government willing and able? You know, just like we categorize the homeless, is the state willing? And is the state able? I think that if we continue to have homelessness, there is a thought that says that the intent is to have homelessness. If we eliminate homelessness, that's a different intent and a different result. Okay, Nolan, uh, thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Christine Camp. Christine was instrumental in creating today's panel. Christine is the president of Avalon Development Company. She has earned many accolades for her leadership and serves on several community boards. Her current focus is finding opportunities to educate the public about the land use policies that greatly add to the true cost of living in Hawaii. And I've learned a lot just from talking with her. And she also wants to encourage policies that increase the supply of housing. Christine's insight in these areas is deep. Christine, please. And Nolan, thank you for setting the stage um, as, as it relates to, you know, state's role in providing um, opportunities for, you know, eliminating homelessness. What I want to focus on is on the provider side and the issues related to, um, you know, supply of housing, because we have issues related to homelessness and that can be related to mental illness and other situations that just providing housing alone can't solve. But what I do want to talk about is from my perspective, what we can do. And I know that um, we're all talking about all the negative impacts of the pandemic. And at this point, we're in the, we're knee deep into the pandemic and we, we don't know where the bottom is going to be, but we have a lot of hope that next year it's going to get better. Um, tourism has just opened yesterday and, you know, we, we hope that it will be smart tourism that's going to keep us safe while our economy starts to grow back again. But what I want to talk about is cost of housing, cost of uh, just living in Hawaii. And when I think about homelessness, it goes into housing, supply of housing, what, and then also what prevents people like me, developers, builders, what prevents us from building more housing? And it's really not a discussion about housing, but it's discussion about policies. We've done it to ourselves. We're so protective about our land, our precious Hawaii, 
that we've put all these guardrails against building more housing. Housing can be built. I can tell you what the nail is going to cost, how, many lum how much lumber is going to cost, what the appliances will be, what kind of carpet it will be. The houses, we know what the cost of housing is going to be, whether it's going to be a one bedroom or a two bedroom. What we can't figure out and what is very expensive because when you don't know, there's uncertainties. And then you have to add on factors for that risk. And what we can't assume is how long it's going to take to build housing. Let's, for example, the affordable housing, which everybody says they want, affordable housing at the lowest level, right? Those at 30% to 60% of median income, where there's not enough of. They're going to build that in Kailua, where there isn't a lot of affordable housing options. And yet the community buckled down under pressure from the neighbors who didn't want it. And now you can't get the housing there. That could have been a shovel-ready project in the midst of the pandemic. But I don't wanna talk about that. I wanna talk about the silver linings in a pandemic. You know, you hear this, is, oh, let's not waste a good crisis. Why? Because in a good crisis, everyone is worried and they all wanna do something. All these policies that caused us to have slowing effects of building housing or even stopping housing altogether, this is a pandemic where everyone is now focused. Th those policies were done by people who were well-intentioned, who care about their community, truly care about their community. But in this pandemic, the lens has shifted. What are we going to do? Things are dire. So I come from the construction and building industry. That's an industry where it's very volatile, right? It goes up and down, boom and bust markets. But this is the construction industry is the one that's been holding us together during the shutdown because they, they were considered essential workers. And construction industry could also be the ones that can be providing the jobs that are necessary to get us out of the pandemic and have a better impact, build more housing. But before we can even do that, we need these great people during this crisis who are trying to do something, shift their mindset, and say, what can we do? This is a crisis. Can we galvanize together to solve an issue? It starts out with trying to address the homelessness. It starts out with trying to address providing housing. It starts out with uh, you know, trying to build um, workforce housing. But what causes them not to get built? Policies that restrict it. So my view is this is a great opportunity for us to look at those policies and galvanize the policymakers, galvanize the community who have been staying silent to speak up and tell people what they need. You know, I don't have to be on this panel and have, every, have a bullseye says that, you know, I, all these policies are wrong, but I choose when you ask to speak about the issue, I choose to step up because I feel that it is our responsibility to educate others that it's the policies that creates the barriers to housing. It's not the construction cost, because we can address construction costs by building smaller homes, but it's the land that needs to get zoned. It's the permitting that either gets permitted or not permitted. And it's those people, the very few vocal minority who are not educated in what really needs to happen, who galvanize to stop these projects. It is upon us to speak out and make sure that our policies are changed as it relates to building housing, because it will do two things, address cost of living in Hawaii and address the next economic, uh, the, the, the gap in the economic output that we, are, we need to address while tourism gets built back up. And I happen to now go on record to say we need tourism because we can't just drive the local economy on the, the same money that's here. We need outside, we're, not a, we're no longer a um, exporting economy. We don't export anything. And for us to grow our economy, we need new monies coming from outside. And what we're selling here is sun, surf, sand, the beautiful, safe Hawaii. Wow, uh, that's a lot to, to take in, uh, Christine, thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Connie Mitchell. 
Connie is the executive director of the Institute for Human Services, where she has focused on ending homelessness for over 14 years. Woven into her e efforts to end homelessness is a strong passion for social and environmental justice, advocacy, advocacy for cross-sector collaboration, which, which we're doing here, and an openness to creative and thoughtful solutions, which also, I hope, we can come up with as we keep talking. Connie has agreed to share her unique viewpoint and she also has a PowerPoint to present. So Connie, please. Thanks so much for um, having me be part of this panel. I just feel very honored to um, you know, just share some of my thoughts as I've been listening to both um, Nolan and Christine. Um, I just really wanna say yes, yes, you know, to so much of what they've already said. You know, um, I. I I don't know whether it's um, good or bad, but you know, for 14 years, I've been working on this issue of homelessness, and just really trying to figure out, um, you know, what we can do. And when I first, you know, became the executive director, I thought, okay, let's really, you know, try to end homelessness and make it happen. But little did I know that there was so much behind um, homelessness. You know, 40 some odd years before when uh, Father Claude Dutille started IHS, uh, homelessness was really, really different. You know, we um, kind of, it, back then had people, um, if a, there was a single mother that was homeless, usually they had worked before, but it was maybe a bad relationship and they were, you know, found themselves not having a home anymore. If somebody could just get the person back working and giving them a job, they could probably find some place you know, to live that they could afford later. But today um, there's just so many more people that I think if they're a single mom, some of them haven't ever worked at all. You know, and there's just that much more to overcome in some ways. The mental health system back then was, you know, um, one that could still get people into treatment. You know, we had the state hospital. You know, we also had, um, you know, local hospitals that had psychiatric units that were much easier for us to get into. Not so much anymore. And, um, you know, the other drugs that came into play back then was mostly alcohol, maybe um, even like maybe for cocaine, but marijuana. But today we have this methamphetamine um, addiction that has gone on at this epidemic that has gone on for so many years. It has just drained so much money out of our community. And it's just really a plague that we haven't really got um, our um, you know, hands around in such a way that we can really feel like we know what they are. There's treatment, but it's just not the same as some of these other substances that have come along. So, you know, I kind of uh, started my part by thinking, well, what do I want to say? I think, you know, we're going to be in the process of rebuilding our community and it's got to have a lot of community, meaning, you know, next slide, you know, there's a lot that is about, um, you know, not just um, the people and the buildings, but it's really about whether we have a spirit of community, whether we care about each other. So, this was just taken from um, the newspaper just a few days ago. We have, you know, um, just so much of a problem here. Um, you know, the, the people that are delinquent on their rent, um, property owners and managers say that 40% have lost jobs. I just heard this morning it was 80,000 people. 85% um, of um, the rent renters are um, behind on rent versus 95%, you know, before COVID our gross domestic product, you know, um, the amount of income to the state has dropped 42% in, you know, when they took that um, snapshot in time. And the visitor industry, you know, prior to COVID had so many people coming, just like, you know, what was described um, earlier. And now, you know, it's a trick. Next slide, please. I think we have to recognize that this is a tsunami of sorts. You know, um, it's both, you know, a, um, not just an economic one, but it's an existential one, I think. You know, we have to ask ourselves, how do we want to rebuild our community and what is going to be a part of it and what's not going to be a part of it anymore? You know, um, as Christine was mentioning, there's so much need for housing. Pre-COVID, I'd say easy, 30,000 units are needed here. We have not really kept up because of the policies of the past, you know, to really continue building the housing that was needed. So we're just way far behind. You know, and the other piece that we're wrestling against is the unemployment that was less than 2% before COVID. And now we're one of the highest in the country. It's, it's incumbent upon us to know that moving forward, 
all these people that are, you know, really um, housing insecure right now, <clears throat> they're going to need places to live. And um, we need even more so affordable housing after COVID. I don't even know when after COVID is going to be at this point. It seems like it's going to be a long time. Um, we need to retool our economy to create higher paying jobs. A lot of the people that, you know, I work with, many of them are working, but it's really hard, you know, to make ends meet when the housing costs are so much. If it, if it takes like 50% of your income, then there's, or more in some cases, there's a lot um, um, of deficit that individual households have to deal with. We have to give young people a reason to stay. I think a lot of people are deciding not to. They have much better opportunities elsewhere. This is an opportunity right now because COVID has leveled the playing field a little, little bit maybe, and maybe people want to stay closer to home. But, you know, if there's opportunities elsewhere, we're, you know, we're going to need to. And then we're facing that government deficit that's moving this right now. That's why this slide I just thought, it really um, captures for me what we're up against. When I um, think about community and what it means, like I said, it's not just the people, although that's a definition. I took this right out of the dictionary. Um, it's it's really us having um, a feeling of fellowship with other people, caring about each other. That to me has to be a part of the solution because earlier the question was, whose responsibility is it to solve the homeless problem? I'm just telling you right now, nonprofits cannot solve it by ourselves, you know, and the government cannot even solve it by itself. And, you know, so I think we really need to think about how we're gonna blend all of those to make new partnerships. I wanna, you know, talk about these um, values, you know, inclusive diversity versus a quick fix for the homeless. You know, when we talk about the homeless, we talk about them as separate from us, different from us. In reality, they're people that are brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers. Of and we really need to think about inclusive diversity, meaning everybody has something to bring to the table. You know, nobody is throwaway. Nobody doesn't have any work. We have to take responsibility, you know, versus the, what I call deliberate indifference or enabling. Two different ways that people deal with um, situations with homelessness. I think that we need to say it is our responsibility if there are people in our um, community that are homeless. We have to find solutions. We also have to, you know, um, you know, not just want to take them away. And I, I don't want to see it. You know, so many people. I get calls all the time of people wanting to um, solve the problem in their neighborhood don't want to see it and I understand businesses really need to have an environment where you know people can actually um you know be able to um, do business but I think we also have to know that we have to come up with solutions that really see people as people also and then there's the people that enable to me you know just giving 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 but never asking something of the person that needs to change they have to make a different decision and I think we have to help people get to that place and tell them, have those hard talks with them, you know, that you can't continue doing this. The third thing is recognizing our connectedness. Instead of having self-interest, you know, um, disguised as civil, protecting civil rights. Um, I'm a psychiatric nurse by training, and so I really feel, you know, like, um, when I see people who are mentally ill, I really want to help them. I want them to get the treatment that they need. But so much of the time, I feel like it's blocked because people think they're protecting people when they want to say, I don't want treatment, but in actuality, all they're doing is enabling them, you know, to just continue uh, to live a life that is really so, uh, such a poor quality. And the last thing is forgiveness and invitation to wholeness versus condemning and alienating people. And I think that one I put up there because I think we need to think about how we want to deal with the folks who have offended, have been incarcerated, and if they come out and they're trying to, you know, reboot their lives, to try to help them instead of just putting up barriers you know, to them. Next slide, please. So this is my slide to affirm what um, Christine just said. We gotta have housing and we have to have it now and we have to have different kinds sometimes. So I say, you know, we need to, um, you know, plan and, and have a commitment to preserve existing, some of the existing housing or refurbish it, rehab it and convert them into affordable housing or maintain them as affordable housing. And I really want to affirm what Christine said about how every community has to have a plan. You cannot say, oh, build the affordable housing over there in another part of the island. You have to really have diversity in your community. And the only way you're going to do that is if you have housing that can um, you know, accommodate people. 
um, of all economic levels. And then um, we need to think about other things. I have a couple of pictures here of just these tiny homes, you know, and uh, we also need to think about, um, you know, public assisted living. I happen to see a lot of older people who are becoming homeless. And I think we really need to think about how we're going to serve that particular problem. Next slide, please. Well said. I think, you know, um, we need bold behavioral health strategies. And I just want to share three quick ones here. We need a campaign to treat um, methamphetamine and all these um, substances, mostly meth use. We have to have a way of aggressively dealing with that. Next one is about um, treatment and diagnosis of mental illness and really creating that as a um, venue. If they're going in for an emer emergency evaluation, we should have the ability to treat them right away. And the last one is about court ordered treatment for people on release from a psychiatric hospital. You know, we need to have a way to keep people on their medications, which we've lost. Right? The last one is you know, about transforming you know, our um, economy through technology. Everybody needs to be literate in technology. And you know, people coming out of jail and prison, people who are you know, recovering from homelessness, I always feel like we gotta get them using the computers. Almost every job now requires you to be able to use the computer. And then of course for families, the children need access to internet and also you know, the, the things that we need in order to do their education, the homeschooling. So that's all I have today. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. That, that was quite a bit. And <laughs> I appreciate that. that was good, good insight. And actually you tied together a lot of things that uh, have just been said by Nolan and Christine. Our final panelist, Today is Sarah Lynn, and I, I told her she had a big advantage because she has heard what everybody says. Sarah is Governor David Ige's lead policy advisor for housing. She's responsible for helping to drive the governor's affordable housing initiatives and serving as his liaison to the private sector, to nonprofits, government stakeholders, and Hawaii's housing community. Sarah can tell us the state's strategy on housing issues raised today. Sarah, floor is yours. Thanks for having me here. And I really appreciate hearing um, everyone talk about, you know, just the, the different contributions, whether from, you know, a private citizen standpoint to, you know, an industry that is one of the few bright spots right now while things are closed, um, the construction industry. And also just really appreciated hearing, you know, Connie's very balanced and thoughtful uh, way to look at what is a not just the problem with the one shot solution, uh, which I think is very easy to often oversimplify. But wow, so many really interesting and compelling thoughts here, you know, whether it's Nolan talking about, you know, finding meaning and the silver lining in this, or um, in the same vein, uh, Christine asking for, you know, a look at policies and shifting of a mindset, you know, to really figure out, is this gonna be the crisis that, that really makes us all pause, you know, and, and, just that one that one image you shared, uh, Connie, about an existential tsunami really struck with me as well. I think one thing to recognize, at least as it relates to rethinking our economy and, and tourism, is that um, it's such a large part of our of our economy. It's not necessarily going to go away. But I think the thing that we need to be cognizant about is that this is the opportunity to really be serious about diversification. And this is a topic um, that certainly ties into housing because you can't have um, you can't have more housing, uh, or sorry, you can't diversify your economy without, you know, all the resources to take care of them, you know, good schools, good housing, affordable housing. Um, but you also, we need to find ways to raise incomes and, and a, a purely service-based economy um, is tough to do that with. Uh, I think that the thing that we're facing here is something similar to a lot of other places as well, this whole idea of over-tourism. Um, the Hawaii Economic Association just had a conference like, about this and talked to some experts from, you know, Cornell's School of Hotel Management. And every place is looking at this as a reset, whether it's, you know, um, an island off of the coast of Spain or even New Zealand, kind of looking at what are some creative ways to not just look at, you know, the marketing of tourism is just purely PR marketing, come to see us. But it's for years and years, tourism has not been run as you would run, I guess, a uh, um, a private business, like it's been run where you take, where the profits are taken out, the profits aren't reinvested into the asset. And the asset here is our people, our, our state, our, you know, our cultural resources, our environmental resources. So 
that's really an opportunity for us to kind of rethink how can we how can we reinvest what does come into the state after this back into the into the asset and continue to make it better. As for you know what we're trying to do for homelessness and affordable housing in general, the, the governor from the beginning of his administration definitely recognized that affordable housing there just wasn't enough. We needed more options, and so he set a goal uh, when he first took office of trying to build 10,000 and complete 10,000 new units by 2020. And for a while we were looking at that thinking, are we gonna hit it, are we gonna hit it? And um, the governor put together a small stakeholder group of the most prolific developers and nonprofits and advocates to talk about some of these policies. What were the things that could be streamlined to help, um, to help make projects go just a little bit faster? And I'm proud to report that that group came out with some really good recommendations over the years, um, whether it was just kind of speeding up approvals, you know, through uh, DCAB or, um, or if it was adding more, adding more funding to the rental housing revolving fund. Um, but those are things that because we've been able to kind of look at those things over the last couple of years, I'm happy to report that we're going to actually exceed our 10,000 by 2020 goal. And I think we're going to be more closer to 12,000 completed by the end of this calendar year with more in the hopper, which is great. Uh, the tough part, though, is that I think Christine would agree that we've kind of got most of the low hanging fruit already. The difficult part now is that, you know, if we want to go vertical or build, you know, more densely in certain areas, we need to figure out the infrastructure for it. Infrastructure meaning how we're going to get the water there, how we're going to get the sewers to be big enough, um, you know, electrical infrastructure as well. And the difficulty, not to sound like a bureaucrat, is that we have to, you know, partner and work well with uh, with the city and county of Honolulu and the other counties on this as well, because it's, it's got to be everybody kind of working together and um, figuring out what the timing of everything is. And so an infrastructure also, you know, is can be very disruptive. It involves, you know, digging up uh, digging up roads and, and putting in new lines. So that's kind of the next major obstacle is figuring out now that we've done the low hanging fruit, how do we prioritize certain areas uh, to have the greatest bang for our buck? And so one strategy that is being employed by the state um, is looking at, for example, on Oahu, the Ibile Kapalama area. This is the area right around Costco where you have um, a lot of concentration of both you know, large parcels of private land in the form of uh, Kamehameha schools and Castle and Cook on one end. And then on the other end, you have a really large concentration of state-owned properties, um, whether it's owned by HPHA or um, the Luliha Civic Center area. Um, so I do know that, for example, HHFDC and the TOD Council is working here to um, prioritize infrastructure planning for that area, not just to make the 30 acres that is owned by the state go, but also to help enable uh, down the line, the private and the privately owned land to go. So just in that one area, this uh, EV Lake Kapalama area, where we're where we're investing in an infrastructure master plan. The idea there is, you know, for those 30 acres of state-owned parcels there that currently have 8,000 units on it, you know, in the next 10 years, I think we could definitely triple that to 24,000 units. And so looking at opportunities like that and figuring out how do we make those things go, what kind of processes can we do, you know, to make the approvals faster. Um, we're looking at that thing. But I, I do I do hear what Christine is saying that, you know, it, it, it needs to be faster. And in some ways, yes, we have done this to ourselves. You know, we love our Ina, you know, we love open space. But I think what's missing from the conversation and the opportunity maybe that that pandemic provides is to talk about these things in more stark terms. It's really about the trade-offs, right? If you're gonna save your open land, what does that mean as far as like uncle gonna be crashing on your sofa, you know, or your child never moving back to Hawaii to ever be close to you when they're having their kids because they just can't afford to be here. I think those are the kinds of things that we don't really hear talked about, whether it's, you know, even clean energy. So if you don't want to have wind farms in your neighborhood, then then that's okay. But what is what does that mean then as far as what your energy prices are going to be? Or you know, does one neighborhood get wind farms, another get solar, things like that? I, I think we really do need to talk about in stark terms, what are the trade-offs? We can't save everything, but what are the things that we as a community agree that are important that are worth saving? 
Um, I guess lastly, the thing that I wanted to talk about again about what the opportunity is. Sadly, I think that it will be a while before we see tourism come back, right? And the economy fully come back. And so you're gonna see things like shopping malls that are gonna be really empty. I mean, certain shopping malls right now, you know, across the entire state, whether it's on Maui or, you know, in, um, in uh, what was that show? You know, Ward Warehouse just went kaboom, you know? Um, I think what you're gonna see is, is an opportunity to possibly figure out how to retrofit and make more mixed use out of those facilities because they're gonna be empty shelves. So what can, the opportunity for me would be, you know, what can we as a, as a government entity or you know, in partnership with the county figure out like, okay, if, if we're gonna make greater mixed use out of these parcels, uh, you know, what can we do to kind of grease the skids? And, and you know, should we have a conversation about that as a community to figure out like, that you know, in Windward Mall, you're going to have a tower there now because maybe that's the best use of the airspace there. Um, and I think that the government's contribution is to figure out how to zone that property well and how to figure out how to get all the infrastructure there to help the private uh, business get what it needs to get done. Uh, but I think that you'll see much more mixed use. You know, things kind of like what we're seeing go up around Ala Moana. They don't all have to be you know, million dollar condos, they can be affordable housing, but we have to kind of figure out how to package the incentives for a builder to, to feel that it's worth his while there. Um, so that's kind of my take on things. You know, I do think that we are, as a state, trying to do and contribute uh, during the pandemic as we can. Uh, we do have the rent relief program um, that we stood up with CARES Money, $100 million to help with back rent and future rent um, up until the end of the year. We're pushing really hard to get that money out um, right now. And, and we've received like overwhelming number of applications. I think 20,000 applications for a program that really is only meant to, to, to help 10,000 families. Um, and I do think that if you look holistically at what the state is, is trying to do around transit oriented development on each of the islands, you know, Hawaii, um, the HPHA, the Public Housing Authority, you know, is looking at what it can do with its lands in Hilo um, and also on, you know, Kauai and Maui. So I think that you're starting to see the, the state entities that do have a lot of land figure out how to use their land a little more efficiently. And, you know, my hope is to just try to facilitate that conversation more. But I agree with everyone here that there is a lot of opportunity here and look forward to the discussion. Well said. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate uh, your point of view. And I, it's funny, what I, I've heard from all of you, something similar. And that is that we have to sit down and think, who are we and who are they? I mean, we have to do some introspection and maybe that's what the pandemic is providing for us. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. I'd like each of you to give me a couple couple minutes on your thoughts, starting with Nolan, on, on where we go from here with, with this issue. And, and, and Nolan, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that you talked about was prioritizing the homeless population. And I don't know if you want to get into that, but your, your, your thoughts on where we go. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody. <laughs> Enlightening, uh, you know, um, one of my heroes is Andrew Cuomo uh, from the uh, governor of New York. And he said that, you know, we ought to be thinking about not how we can go back to how our lives before the pandemic, but how can we make it better? And certainly uh, we ought to be starting the conversation now in order to impact the future. And the conversation is so wide and it needs all of the input, especially with people like yourselves. Uh, but we got to have the conversation. One of the things that we were talking about is the homeless and then, you know, prioritize, prioritizing that. I know Connie's IHS has a triage program that they're looking at Chinatown. Uh, my thoughts was that the first targeted population should be taking our minor children off of the streets. You know, that, they, you know, they don't have a choice. Uh, a lot of them are abused. Uh, uh, they're following parents that have not lived up to their responsibility. And uh, some of my ideas is that existing structures like hotels that are going to be in trouble 
because of the decrease in tourism as it stands, could be purchased and provide single room occupancies for uh, people like our youth or things like that. The, 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 the cost of money now is such that a couple could be in a hotel room for about $1,200 a month including meals provided by the restaurants on site. And that certainly reaches any uh, definition of affordability. Feed them, put a roof over their head until the transition periods can be over and then move on from there. But we need to start the conversation now in order to impact the results later. Okay, Christine, uh, next to you, what are your thoughts? And you know, one, one thing, uh, you know, you talked about changing policies and, and again, uh, or not being afraid to talk about these things, speaking out. So please take, take it. Well, I'd like to, I wanna to respond to what Nolan said about the SRO, single room occupancy. I'd like to resonate that thought among the community because it's one that's, you know, it, we need to have one. We can't just rely on the shelters, there's just not enough. Um, the idea, however, of having resorts or, or you know, hotels in tourist district filled with SROs with mental health problems um, and people who uh, you know, are, they're, they're not going to make the best face for Hawaii. And so I'm not sure if I can support the hotel use, but I, I do support the idea of SROs. And I think that that's a room where government can intervene. We can build it, we can bring some nonprofit to be the, the sponsor of it, where government funds can be leveraged with community funds to build SROs. And I absolutely believe that will help our economy. You, you know, we manage about 2 million square feet of commercial space and about a thousand units. You don't know how much we spend on the, and, and pass on to our businesses for security and cleanup after the homeless people. If you can add all of that up, I'm sure businesses will pay a, a, a tax to house these homeless people away from their front door and, and their properties. And so it's one of those things where I think the pandemic should create um, a superpower by the government to say, we are going to build an SRO here. I hope it's not in the tourism area. I hope it's in areas where there will be mental health services and drug the treatment services. Maybe it's coupled with that. The idea is that the time has come where we need to make hard choices. There's been enough discussion, enough studies. Time is short now. This is a pandemic where we can say there's a sense of urgency and we no longer can just wait for the low hanging fruits, which Sarah has done an amazing job for the governor. If there's an effective area within the governor's administration, it's been Sarah Lynn and Denise Matsubara and what they've been able to accomplish for building housing. But it's not enough and it's not going fast enough. Yeah, thank you, Christine. And also, you know, you, you talked about uh, the economy uh, and homelessness and how helping homelessness can help the economy. And they're not, they're not two separate items. They're, they're, they're linked and, but we have to recognize that. And maybe we don't recognize it. Uh, maybe we put a distinction and, and Connie, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, I mean, you deal with this every day and uh, you deal with perceptions and, uh, you know, who are they, who are we type, type of thoughts. So what are your thoughts about the future after the pandemic? I like the idea. I really love the idea of, you know, doing more SROs, you know, across the island in different places. And I think there also is a place for it in Waikiki, maybe not for the folks who are, you know, needing treatment, but there are a lot of people who need an SRO because they're construction workers, you know, they're, um, you know, other uh, workers in Waikiki, it just puts them closer so they can even walk to work, maybe. Short of that, I really need for people to focus on providing treatment. We can save so much money, we can save the state so much money, um, you know, if we could get people back to work. People who have the chance to actually recover, you know, and really become contributing citizens, and they are there. And I also believe very strongly that a lot of our folks who are low-level offenders, you know, um, who are being released, you know, um, from um, public safety, they have an opportunity. If given the opportunity, 
they would choose you know, to work. They just go back to the street and criminal behavior because there is nothing for them. We have to make the pathway to being a contributing citizen a lot easier for people so that they can choose that. I think we put away too many barriers. But I love what you have said. Christine. Can I can I ask you a question, Mark? Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Um, I you know that a lot of homeless people are homeless because they the landlords will not accept them because landlords you know, can't accept pedophiles or they can't accept um, ex-convicts or whatever it may be. I mean, they, they just put these barriers because they want to keep it safe for the residents. But they need to be employable and they become homeless and they, be, they go back to crime. So I'm hoping that there will be programs for people. I'm looking for those low level criminals. Maybe there's an amnesty for them. Wipe the slate clean so they don't have a record just because they were, you know, they had a misdemeanor that they shouldn't allow that to be a permanent record. It should so sort of like bad credit. It should wipe away in five years or something so that they can start all over. Because right now you have a record, you can't get a job. You can't get a home. I mean, these, these are the factors in causing homelessness for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, Connie, uh, thank you. Uh, Christine, thank you uh, for the questions. Now, Sarah, you, you'll be happy to know that not everybody says this is the total responsibility of the government. It, it sounds like the, everybody that's talked today said, talked about the community and individuals and basically internal philosophies. But where, where are you for the future with the government after the pandemic with homelessness? So, you know, as a Keiki Okaina who born and raised here, you know, went away and worked on the mainland, educated on the mainland for college and then came back. I'm, I'm a long hauler, I'm a lifer here. You know, I'm, I'm here despite the, you know, the cost and the price of paradise, you know, thank goodness I have, you know, a parental support network, you know, to help babysit kids once in a while kind of thing. But suffice to say that, you know, I, I do come in part in my background from the private sector. And then I came into government because I wanted to kind of walk the talk. I was a journalist before um, and a co-founder of Civil Beat, you know, before coming to government. And I wanted to, you know, see how hard it was to change from the inside. And I can tell you, it's really hard. Um, there, there's just a lot of, you know, entrenched thinking. Uh, but at the same time, I, government is such a part of life and big here and, and is, you know, through regulation or through, you know, things that, that were started with well intentions, you know, like government here needs, needs to be a part of the solution because they are currently part of the problem sometimes. Um, I, I do think that, you know, just more transparency, more conversations. It's really in the messaging, how you talk about it, how you bring the community together and how you, I think we need to just change how we talk about things. It can't just be all nostalgia for the past. It's gotta be like, what's the path forward? You know, what is gonna be the compromise? Everybody gonna be a little unhappy, sorry to say, but you know, this is the way that we all hoo forward and come together and say, well, what are the trade-offs? You know, I'm happy to save this vista for you or this open space or, you know, not put this solar project in your backyard or not put this affordable housing there. But then, you know, what is the other sacrifice or contribution that you can make to our society? And I think that that's a tough conversation, but, you know, it's got to be had and, and government needs to be part of it because we're, we're both part of the enabling solution with funding and, 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 you know, permits and things and approval. But, you know, we also have to kind of get out of the way a little bit sometimes. Yeah, you know, um, I think all the cards are on the table. I think uh, we've we've thrown them out there, and people have, you know, people have to listen. Uh, you folks have spoken, uh, and we have to continue this discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists today: Nolan An, Christine Camp, Connie Mitchell, and Sarah Lynn. They represent the greatest assets of Hawaii. They're dedicated and passionate about finding meaning for Hawaii now and in the future after the pandemic. And the pandemic has created this discussion in a way. It's made us think about it uh, a little bit deeper and it's given us this opportunity. So let's continue this discussion. Let's help each other find the true and beneficial meaning for Hawaii in the future. Aloha everybody.